Thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to presenting this paper. I think there's a lot of people here whose feedback I'm going to really appreciate getting. Um, thanks especially to the three discussants. Well, I say thank you now. I may not feel the same way afterwards. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Um, okay. So, um, this is a paper that has been sitting around and with uh, my, my colleague Todd, um, he works on investment arbitration. And when I've, the story, the, the paper really comes from discussions that we had when I was talking about the introduction of arbitration into tax treaties and uh, with Todd and some other people who work on investment arbitration and they were saying, what is this? This doesn't make any sense to us. It doesn't look like anything that we would call arbitration. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't make sense in terms of the incentive structure that we think of for arbitration. It's very bizarre. Um, and so we, we thought it would be something to try and write a paper on. But we haven't, we've struggled a little bit to get the angle quite right, and so uh, hopefully some of the feed feedback here will help us in, in trying to um, work out what's the real story we're trying to tell. Okay, so let me begin with a few quotes. These are quotes from political scientists that, who write about the international tax regime. Um, and the thing you'll find is the same with all of them, here, fiscal policy is a quintessential prerogative of sovereign states. Um, States have been extremely reluctant to cede their sovereignty in the European Union. As we know, the Commission's now trying to push for, to end the veto over tax policy, but it's unlikely that that's going to be successful. Um, uh, Commenting tax havens would have great implications for the modern doctrine of sovereignty. Um, no policy-making competence is more central to the idea of the modern state than taxation. So political scientists look at the international tax regime and they see a constraint on the way in which states cooperate in taxation compared to other areas which is this notion of fiscal sovereignty, that states in the area of tax really want to retain their own ability to, their own sovereignty. And it's not just political scientists. Let's look at what uh, legal scholars and practitioners say. This is David Rosenblum, who was the US treaty negotiator in the 1980s. International tax policy is close to the beating heart of national sovereignty. Um, here's a guy called Pascal Santamans, writing in, uh, say, speaking in 2004. Taxation is the heart of state sovereignty. If we want states to come to the table, he's talking about arbitration. We want them to know they haven't lost that sovereignty. And here is Itai Grimberg at uh, um, uh, in Washington, D.C. Governments care about their taxing rights a lot, and giving them up feels like a loss of sovereignty. So legal scholars and practitioners also think that sovereignty is a significant obstacle to cooperation, but that it's something unique about taxation, fiscal sovereignty. Um, and if we look at the history of inter international economic co cooperation, if you look at investment, ar investment cooperation and trade cooperation, arbitration has been a part of the way in which disputes are resolved for a long time. Um, taxation, on the other hand, is a more recent phenomenon. So that delay would imply also that there's something more that states have to get over in order to agree to arbitration in taxation compared to other policy areas. Um, and yet, in 2017, here's the signing of the multilateral instrument at the OECD, uh, 27 states, I think it is, signed up at that point in time to mandatory binding arbitration inside their tax treaty. And as we now know, it's currently, uh, it's currently at the forefront of discussions about the su successes of the MLI, so the BEPS 2.0 as it's called, uh, so it's <coughs> called um, that it needs to include some kind of mandatory binding. <coughs> They're not calling it arbitration anymore, but dispute settlement. Um, so uh, something has changed. States are now very keen on the, uh, well not very keen, but many states are quite keen on the idea of arbitration. And this is odd because in 1984 the OECD considered the topic, and here's what they said, it will be an unacceptable surrender of fiscal sovereignty. So they didn't say at this time it doesn't seem to be the right thing. They made a much more uh, unequivocal statement that said this is, in its design, in its very nature, something which would be unacceptable. So what's happened that 30 years later, not only is it acceptable, but it's actually something which is uh, seen as very desirable. That's the question that we wanted to look at. Um, so there's the questions, why do states agree to, agree to do this, um, and why did it take so long? Um, and then we also think it has some relevance to understanding sovereignty more generally in the international sphere. So to do that, um, we looked at a uh, discussion about the arbitration issue throughout time. Um, I observed a lot of international meetings at which it was discussed. And I interviewed some people who'd been involved either as arbitrators or negotiators. Um, I think possibly Michael was one of those people. Um, uh, and one of the things <coughs> we did with them is we came up with a, we said perhaps part of the answer to this question comes from a more granular understanding of what sovereignty is. 
So we just talk about sovereignty, fiscal sovereignty, but, but what, what does that actually mean? And looking in the literature, the international relations literature on sovereignty, we, we came up with this typology, which divides in two categories. So de jure and de facto. So de facto sovereignty is your control over outcomes in practice, and de jure is your control over uh, outcomes in principle. So, for example, if you are a member of the world's largest trading bloc of 28 countries, then de jure, you have given up some sovereignty. If you leave it, de jure, you've brought that sovereign back, but perhaps de facto, you've lost it. Um, so that will be one way of, uh, of thinking about Brexit using our schema. Um, domestic um, is your control over what happens within your borders as a government. And international is, I guess, your control over what happens at the meeting of borders and as things cross borders. So then we divide up um, different, we, we kind of fill this table in. And I'm not going to labour it too much, but I just want to say wh where I think we are in the international tax regime, right? So <coughs> states want to keep this. They want to be able to, in practice, achieve their domestic policy goals. And that's what motivates cooperation between states. They also want to hold on to this bit as much as possible the ability to write their own tax laws. So the bits they've been willing to give up so far are administrative, and you see that through cooperation on exchange of information, you see that uh, through mutual agreement procedure cooperation. So it's willing to pull the way in which they administer laws if it enables them to keep control of writing them. Um, they've also been willing to give this up. This is essentially the right to determine who they sign a treaty with. And states have been willing now to enter into a regime where you are, the regime obliges you to sign treaties for exchange of information, at least, with other states. Um, and that's what we see through the OECD processes. Um, what we're talking about here is this. Judicial sovereignty, the right to interpret tax laws, the right for your courts to interpret tax laws. So you can see this as a division of the state following Tocqueville into the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. Um, so that's what we're looking at. And so, to our knowledge, no one has written about this in the context of tax before. And just a quick comment, yep. if I may. Yep. I, I think this what, what you might wish to specify is that, however, when it comes to um, administrative enforcement, uh, the public international law constraints are much, much more severe than then when it comes to uh, the jurisdiction uh, to legislate. And so it's kind of natural that states are more willing to cooperate in the administrative sphere because they can do much less on their own. So you can... Right. In order to realize your tax rights, you have to cooperate. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, great. Okay. So in a way, it's not really giving up. This is right. Mm. You're not really giving anything up in administrative cooperation as much as you are gaining something. Well, that depends on how you conceptualize sovereignty. But in the way that states feel about sovereignty, the decision to exchange information is not a giving up something. But if you ask Rand Paul, for example, he would say <laughs> differently. <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, but I think <coughs> that's what you're, the point you're making is the way in which it's been seen by states and the decision they've made about cooperation, right. apart from in the Senate. Yes. Um, okay, so then that we tell a historical story. This is drawing on a lot of literature already out there about path dependence in the development of the international tax regime. So in that story, in the League of Nations, Eduardo has already talked about historical sequencing. So in the League of Nations era, a regime is created, and states decide at that point that they're going to design a regime which preserves their sovereignty in the ways that I've described. So they don't agree to create a multilateral binding agreement. Instead, they agree on bilateral, a network of bilateral treaties. They don't uh, agree on a hard template for how taxing rights will be divided. They leave that the bilateral negotiations. So you choose who you enter into a treaty with. You choose how, what taxing rights you give up when you enter that treaty. Um, and you also, in terms of the taxation of multinational companies, you, the, the, use, the, the separation of companies up into their constituent parts through the separate entity principle and the arm's length principle, that's also, we argue, a way in which states preserve sovereignty. Because if you decide to conceptualize the multinational company as a whole entity and, and divide it up in a unitary way, then what you're doing is agreeing on a greater pooling of sovereignty over your decision about how you tax multinational companies at multilateral level. So what does my next slide go? Okay, so then in the 1970s, with capital account liberalisation, the growth of capital flows across borders and much more uh, the growth and increasing complexity of multinational companies, this regime comes under strain. This decentralised approach struggles to work. And the narrative we generally hear is about the double non-taxation problem, which begins when the 60s, 70s, and, and becomes more and more intense as time goes on. But the same problem also occurs in the area of double taxation. So 
a growing problem occurs, which is that states um, in the administration of their tax laws disagree on how to interpret tax treaties, and that creates double taxation in the application of treaties. So they've signed on something in advance, but when it comes to the implementation of it by the assessing officers, they then try and claw back a bit more revenue than perhaps the policy side intended, or at least they try to interpret it in a way which is more favourable to that country, and that creates clashes, double taxation. So how do they respond to that? Well, they try to respond by retaining sovereignty as much as possible. So the first thing they do um, is they elaborate more and more detailed guidance on how to interpret the model treaties. And so this is the number of words in the OECD model treaty and the transfer pricing guidelines over time. And you can see it increases tenfold between the first OECD model in 1963 and the post-BEPS model in 2017. So more and more detailed guidance, which is aimed at trying to uh, ex ante specify how to interpret a treaty to try and prevent disputes ex post. Um, but that doesn't actually solve the problem. Um, so then what they do is they introduce an ex post di dispute settlement and this begins, it's always been there but it, it becomes m more expansive in the 1980s, this is the mutual agreement procedure. Um, so states then introduce a process by which it's foreseen that, <coughs> that where you disagree you can try and reconcile your interpretations. Um, but as we know, um, the map also doesn't work brilliantly because it's a sovereignty preserving design because you're not obliged to reach an agreement you're obliged to talk to each other but if you want to hold on to your tax taxing rights your tax base then you're not obliged to cede them at some point and so the number of disputes grows uh, many of those disputes are not resolved satisfactory as far as taxpayers are concerned there's no because there's no hard time limit on the map either so <coughs> Here's just a few quotes from businesses <coughs> complaining about how the map doesn't work. Um, I won't read them out. And, uh, you know the sentiments that states are not always uh, acting with uh, um, good faith in the way that they participate uh, and that, that the whole system is creaking under the strain of the large number of unresolved cases. Um, so, then we move forward. I think my timeline's going to move. There we go. So then we move forward to this. Um, this period here. So, in, oh, you can't quite see because I think my thing is designed in widescreen, but between the late 1970s and the early 1980s, uh, proposals <coughs> to fix this problem using arbitration are tabled. So, both by private lawyers act, uh, influencing the OECD and also by the European Commission. So, both sides consider the idea of arbitration. And in both, case, in both of those venues, it's rejected in the form it's proposed. So, the OECD just says outright, arbitration it, it would be an un unacceptable sum of sovereignty. On the EU side, the Commission proposes a directive, and the Member States say, when they proposed that in 1976, the Member States say, no, we're not willing to have a directive because we're not willing to see the, our judicial sovereignty given up to the extent that the European Court of Justice would ultimately decide on disputes. And so instead what they agree on is a convention outside of the usual EU processes, which is not... Uh, uh, which is not ultimately decided by the European Court of Justice. So they agree on something which does introduce arbitration, but it does so in a way which is less, uh, less constraining on sovereignty because it's not ultimately uh, uh, subject to an ECJ ruling. Um, and then, although the OECD doesn't agree to arbitration, gradually OECD member states start to introduce arbitration clauses into their treaties, the first one being the US-Germany Treaty from 1989. Um, it's non-binding arbitration, it's optional arbitration, if both sides want it, um, but they still introduce it. So we begin to see first steps towards something which looks like mandatory and binding arbitration. And so we see this as a process of experimentation. At each stage, states try to design a solution, beginning with the map, which helps resolve disputes while retaining sovereignty. And at each stage, they find that the retention of sovereignty means that the process doesn't work. So they have to agree to something <coughs> which is more sovereignty constraining as time goes on. And so that's what happens. Over time, we get to a point at which, um, by 2006 to 7, uh, the OECD now introduces mandatory and binding arbitration into its model. And we, sa we think that the key to that story is the US, because the EU has, in principle, already agreed to this in the convention. It's the US that's holding out. And it's 2006 that the US agrees to see it inside its, some of its actual treaties. And that and breaks. And Japan, too. I think Japan. Yes. Its view. That was important. Yeah, that's actually really true. Yeah. And I haven't looked at the Japanese side at all. Yeah. Um, and so that, that those two countries having ceded. Then in 2007, it becomes part of the OECD model, although in a, in a form where not many states still don't include it. Um, 
And then skip forward another 10 years and you see the step change with the introduction of an EU directive. So that thing which in 1976 states says we won't do, in, in 2017 they agree to do. Similarly, at the OECD level, it becomes part of the multilateral instrument. It becomes much more mainstream in terms of what are we, the practice of OECD states. So we've seen this change, and it's through a process of incremental erosion of sovereignty, of experimentation. So then just, just, just to, uh, one last thing to say is what happens between here and here. How do we get from this not very binding form of arbitration to a more <coughs> binding form? And from the interviews and from what I read, I identify four... Oh, this is just some... Uh, quotes explaining from people saying how it wasn't really working in the first stage. So the European convention, uh, the, the convention uh, practitioner said it wasn't working at all because the countries wouldn't let you get in. They would frustrate taxpayers' attempts to gain access to arbitration. Um, and similarly in the US, people saying, well, the point in the US was that it was optional in treaties and it was never used in those optional treaties. Um, <coughs> so then, what happens to get us from here to here? So four things that we identify. So the first is a series of large, unresolved double taxation cases at MAP. And the key one is that, that, that's uh, publicly discussed is the GlaxoSmithKline case between the UK and the US. $1.3 billion, I think, is the amount of double taxation that's unresolved. So cases like that start to increase the heat on states to fix this problem. Uh, also between the US and Canada. I think that those are the other, that's the other place where a lot of large cases happen. Secondly, the experience with the EU Convention, which shows those other countries, the US and, and Japan, that um, arbitration, that you can sign up to arbitration in a way which doesn't necessarily lead to a vast number of cases and the creation of jurisprudence and all the kind of supranational governance you're concerned about. You can, sign, you can design arbitration in a way that is sovereignty, still preserves some sovereignty. Okay, can I just say on that? Yep. That, that the other one that I referred to was the US Canada. A relationship saying how wonderful but, but of course there's an inherent problem everything's secret even the number of cases so you're trusting the US and Canada to 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 say yeah it really works it's wonderful and the other thing of course is every country we've had so so far has developed <laughs> but you'll come to that no doubt well actually I'm trying to not yeah. go there in this paper but yes yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the US Canada thing yeah we could talk about. I think there's something in the paper about that. But, but the secrecy is, you know, <coughs> it's wonderful. It's yeah. working beautifully, and, and but we can't even tell you how many cases there are. So no, and it's very clear. Yeah. It's very clear that that secrecy is part of the sovereignty preserving design. Any information you put in the public domain starts to create some amount of precedent, even if it's just the number of cases. You I, I think to, it's yeah. the tax officials wanting to keep it within the secrecy of map. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more than country sovereignty, it's tax official sovereignty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting. Um, third thing, uh, the experience at the World Trade Organization. So by this point, by the sort of 2000s, there's been arbitration in the WTO for a while, and actually it's not been such a problem for the US as there were initial concerns it might have been, and so that's... Um, that, that's uh, given an example to policymakers of a form of arbitration they've done that actually seems to have worked. And then finally, the introduction of a procedural innovation in the US. And now my, there we are. This is the one. <laughs> so the form of arbitration that's used in the US Canada Treaty is baseball arbitration. It's named after the way in which uh, salary negotiations in the US Baseball League work, mainly League Baseball. Um, and in that process, uh, rather than the arbitration panel looking at two two positions and forming their own view so in the middle it's last best offer that means that they just each side levels of tables of proposal and the arbitrators have to pick one and they can't explain why so it doesn't create any jurisprudence because the there's no explanation for the decision um, and so the reason why the US found this preferable and it's not just administrators this <coughs> part of the story it's also Congress is that they could say we're not going to get create get to the point that we're subject to supranational jurisprudence because no information will be known about why the decisions were reached. So those four things create the conditions for the shift from non-binding weak arbitration towards gradually stronger arbitration. So that's the, oh yes, and that just, this table just shows how it gets stronger by a bunch of measures of sovereignty uh, constraint. Um, so what, uh, let me just say why it took them so long. So partly it's path dependence, you build a regime in one way and it's quite difficult to swerve that around to, f to subsequently do something which is not designed to do. Um, preference to retain sovereignty, and we have to be careful about what we mean by sovereignty, um, and uh, experimentation. 
with designs which gradually give up bits of sovereignty rather than doing it in one go. And the final point I think I want to make is it's easier to understand why states would give up sovereignty in the area of double non-taxation, right? If you want, if tax avoidance and tax evasion are preventing you from mobilising from <coughs> revenue you have to raise, that's an existential problem for the state. It will need to give up sovereignty to fix that. But double taxation is an investment promotion problem. It's not the same order of magnitude for states. And if they're willing to give up sovereignty in this area as well, going back to those original quotes that I made, we argue that that suggests that perhaps some fiscal sovereignty isn't such a special thing for states after all. Okay. Um, so thanks, thanks Martin and thanks Eduardo for the opportunity to discuss this paper. So in typical Martin fashion, it's a really good paper, it's really well researched. Um, so I'll just kind of maybe start by, I wouldn't really go over this because I think he's really given a good overview of, of what, what the paper talks about. and. He, I, I like that they start from, um, the authors start from, kind of give a really good historical or a good background of, of the origins of disparatization <coughs> in, um, in international taxation and, you know, um, that the explain that the goal of countries has always been to preserve um, de jure legis legislative, administrative and judicial sovereignty and international sovereignty. And then he goes on to talk about increased capital mobility in the 1970s and the complications that that came with and that the double taxation regime basically failed to fulfill its purpose. And then they go on to talk about the incremental changes that <coughs> he's trying to put into place and kind of the uh, different bilateral treaty, but the, the fact that the different bilateral treaties and the superstructure of soft international and hard national laws built on them couldn't really easily be pulled apart to introduce something new, and then brings it all brings us all the way down to 2017 when the states actually de decide to embrace um, binding arbitration. So Martin's objective in this paper is basically to trace the process. Um, the, the countries went through in, or the incre incremental process through which um, they moved from the position where mandatory arbitration was completely unacceptable to the point where they're open to embracing this. And I think that there, the paper basically um, has two theoretical contributions that exp explain this significant change. One is the theoretical contribution um, in the paper in methodology use a historical institutionalist account of the international tax regime. And the second theoretical contribution is just a really good explanation of sovereignty and breaking it down into the different types of sovereignty. And you saw the chart that Martin had um, where he says, well, this is what the countries <coughs> are willing to give up, but judicial sovereignty is something that they held, held back on, um, on, on compromising on. <coughs> um, and I really liked how you integrated and e expanded these four dimensions of sovereignty with a distinction between uh, the de jure, de, jure, de jure sovereignty and the de facto sovereignty. I think that was really kind of very clear and very well done. And then obviously, and also the empirical research was quite, was quite strong with um, you know, interviews uh, uh, with and informal discussions with um, experts in this. So I think the strength of the paper, I think it's very important and topical. It was, it's very well researched, so that was quite impressive for me that the literature review was really excellent. Uh, the historical account of the developments to this date are very interesting and I think it makes a significant contribution to the literature in this area. So I did think that there was kind of, I, th I, I think I had you speak a little bit about that just now when you were answering the question. But I think for completeness, it would be interesting to know what the discourse was in developing countries when this kind of discussions were taking place in higher income countries, and how does the discourse in developing countries fit in with the theoretical narrative that um, <coughs> you develop in the paper. So for example, I was looking at the East African Community Double Tax Treaty that was signed in 2010. It's not yet in force, but it was signed at around the same time that kind of these developments <coughs> were taking place. Um, it provides for a map, but no kind of arbitration provisions despite the significant changes that you discussed <coughs> in peace just before then. Um, and it would be interesting to know whether in the years since the signing of that treaty, for example, has a discourse changed, will the partner states, for example, be more willing to go down the arbitration route 
now that it seems to be something that is catching Just on that ATAF has come out against mandatory yeah. binding arbitration. Sorry? ATAF has, has come, come out, out against, against it. that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then it's kind of a statement that you make at the end that the price of tax sovereignty is much lower than you might previously have thought, which I think is kind of where you concluded as well. And I wonder whether this is true for all countries, it kind of assumes a homogeneous or kind of a uniform way of looking at this issue by all countries. I, I, am, I think high income countries might be more willing to give up their judicial sovereignty because they have the resources to undertake and succeed in international arbitration. But is this true for lower income countries? And with the BEPS action likely to lead to an increase in tax disputes, what is actually the price um, of judicial sovereignty? tax sovereignty for lower income countries. So I think that was, it's kind of an amazing piece and maybe you might feel like it's not, you know, it's beyond the scope of this paper, but I feel like for completeness there needs to be kind of a bit of a mention about that. And then just other questions and maybe areas for research. Uh, so there were significant changes taking place around 2007 and I wondered whether the global financial crisis played any role at all. I don't think that was mentioned, but I thought I mean, maybe there might be kind of something there. Um, and then another question that I had is what are the <coughs> domestic constitutional implications of these advancements, whether you're aware of <coughs> certain co domestic constitutional challenges that have been raised um, in countries where they've surrendered this judicial sovereignty, are there constitutional issues, both, I guess, in high and lower income countries, or whether it's, it's not an issue at all. And then I know that this wasn't really a normative paper. You, I think it was obvious that you st stayed clear of giving an opinion whether you think this is a good thing or a bad thing. But I think kind of for future research, you know, I, I think it would be good to kind of think about some of the thi this, the, the issues that probably ATAF would have, the, the risk that high income countries have to date consumed the benefits of an incremental development. They've had time to come to this position and consume the benefits of that time while lower income countries would be expected to rapidly embrace this radical change without the benefits of, of incrementalism. And when I just talk about the benefits of incrementalism, I think there are several. You know, it's politically expedient. It's easier to accept because you don't have this radical change thrashed upon you. It's simpler to implement incremental changes and radical, uh, a radical change. And I, I just I was reading um, uh, Leonard's chapter uh, where he says that time and <coughs> policy space necessary to landscape the issue and develop sufficient expertise to confidently judge the pros and cons for developing countries. And I think higher income countries have probably had the opportunity to do that. While if we kind of just wholesale embrace this right now in lower income countries. And they have the time. multinationals that benefit most too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. very important. Mm. Exactly. Um, and then finally, because tax scholars are always concerned with complexity, um, I really like the baseball arbitration thing, it was <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, so just maybe just future research in terms of complexity, the outcomes of the baseball arbitration rules versus the reasoned arbitration process. What is there kind of, a, are you trading off complexity um, with in terms of kind of getting simpler decisions with the baseball rules or yeah. you know just kind of basically analyzing these different types of arbitration and seeing different distinctions in the outcome. Yeah. Other than that, I think it is I generally think it's a fantastic paper and it's really timely and relevant and makes a significant contribution from a theoretical, methodological and a policy perspective. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, you can leave that slide up because I thought that was a great summary of what I thought uh, um, ab about the paper. Um, that it was a, a really good paper, Martin, and I, th I think as uh, Daisy's made clear, um, there are a lot of rich strands uh, in it. So I was going to sort of pick up, not really in the sense of the, the substance of some of the issues it raised about tax policy, but the two issues of the path dependency and the lessons for future policy and the really important um, issue <coughs> on, on sovereignty. Um, now, I think it's quite good you've got Daisy, me and, and Partho. Uh, there's quite a lot of path dependency in our own uh, journey to this room in 2019. We all come from different backgrounds, so I was quite encouraged that uh, Daisy's uh, conclusions were very much um, 
uh, uh, the, the same as mine. And I say I'm happy, happy to uh, leave that up. Um, uh, look, I'm, I'm not a sort of uh, a political historical uh, expert. Uh, and I hadn't read uh, about Kinzer until I read your paper, but I thought the the distinction between de jure and de facto is is not just really important here, but obviously in a sense is completely what Brexit is about. We think we're getting some de jure uh, sovereignty back, which we may or may not do, but we're sure as hell not getting any de facto uh, sovereignty back. And I'll come back not to Brexit, but to um, some, some comments on uh, fiscal sovereignty. Um, but just picking up a sort of few de detail points before talking uh, about path dependency and, and sovereignty um, uh, specifically. Um, look, I, I completely agree with the, in the analysis that um, w where we are was a completely inevitable consequence of, of what went on in the decisions in the 1920s. I wasn't sure I was completely there that, um, you know, the drawbacks of the ar arm's length principle uh, were sort of fact dependent from the 1920s, um, that it wasn't really just because, uh, you know, I, I think the, the choices there reflect the sort of rentier nature of capitalism generally and the inevitability that those who have the power to make decisions would make those decisions um, today or, or then. And I think there are some really interesting questions within this about who is a fiscal sovereignty for the benefit of. Um, and, and I think uh, picking that up, uh, you know, is, uh, is is quite important. But I mean, clearly the 1920s were a critical juncture, and Eduardo, in his opening, put up a great time sequence where uh, you know the get the wars were in the gaps, um, and it sort of picks up Daisy's point about incrementalism. That the exciting time for tax policy is always when we've had a war. I mean, all the wars in this country. Uh, have a, uh, all the taxes in this country have been generated more or less uh, you know, as a consequence of war, whether it was with the French, it was usually with the French in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, and then the First and Second World Wars here, both of which led to radical tax changes. So, so clearly there's a, uh, a, a historical element to when we actually move from incremental to more radical change, and maybe we're seeing some of that um, now. Um, uh, you, you talked about, um, so I'm just looking at the, jotting the points that I, picking out the points I, <coughs> I jotted down. Um, you, you, and I, I mentioned to this earlier, um, you, you talked about mutual agreement procedures being determined by narrow national interests. And, and, and I challenged you when we spoke beforehand on the use of the word narrow. In a sense, this is all what it's about. National interests, um, yes, they are narrow because they're national in a global context, but that's not a pejorative term, it's a reflection of the reality of what we're having to deal with, that national interests are narrow, we can't, uh, we can't decry national interests for being narrow, that's why uh, na nations have their own interests, because they are narrowly um, concentrating, focusing on their citizens. Um, so, so those were just some specific points. Um, coming on to the sort of two substantive strands, and uh, I'd really like to see, you know, in a sense, more papers written out of both strands. Um, the the element of path dependency, <coughs> um, I, in a sense, it's in a sense it is self-evidently true, uh, and and the sequence of historical <coughs> of the 1920s and the development of of international tax dispute resolution is is clearly uh, highly path dependent, step by step. And, and precisely because tax uh, is something which necessarily moves slowly, there was there was never going to be an opportunity to to jump sideways, and so that it was going to be um, path dependency. But as I've said, I I think um, uh, an alternative world probably would not have been that different. I think it is it is quite hard to see either the decisions in the 1920s, or sorry, decisions a hundred years ago. It being different in almost any set of factual circumstances, um, global circumstances that existed in the 1920s. Um, uh, but also, a, a more substantive point for me as a former policy maker is the question of how much that helps you um, improve the quality of decision making for the future. Even if you believe there is a high degree of path dependency uh, in this area, does that actually help you, which is, in a sense, what is the role of research in this area, make better um, decisions and understand longer term impacts better. Um, uh, 
I, I, I wasn't convinced. I thought it was a fascinating historical analysis, but uh, I wasn't quite sure how much it, it helped me today. Um, where I did feel that your paper really helped me, you know, in, in the role of the tax, my former role as tax policymaker and tax um, uh, administrator, was the understanding of, of, of sovereignty. And, um, you know, it's good that we're here in the law faculty, and law ultimately is about words. Um, but some words can become completely overburdened, and uh, it would be nice to get rid of them. And sovereignty is definitely um, one of those words. You know, and it, it, it's been said that, you know, of all the nations on earth who really do have sovereignty, probably the best example is North Korea. Um, and, uh, you know, is that where you, <coughs> you want to be? But I, I, I think a, a number of points which your paper started did bring out is, first of all, whether fiscal sovereignty is different, um, whether, you know, there is this exceptionalism about um, tax. And I think, uh, and there was interesting comparison, I think, made both by you, came out of the earlier paper um, about the, uh, you know, who, who, who was interested in the sovereignty. Um, and I think, uh, you know, why is it easier to agree arbitration in trade? Because the state has much less stake uh, in the sovereignty over trade disputes than it does over tax disputes because tax disputes are about the money and the financing of the state. And that, I think, explains, uh, in a sense, the uh, e e exceptional different nature of fiscal sovereignty, which I, you know, I, uh, I completely accept and support because the, the raising of tax is a fundamental aspect of the tax in, of the state in a way that, um, you know, uh, administering trade or managing trade may or, or may not be depending on domestic choice, whereas tax raising also is. But I think it raises a very interesting question here, whether in, in the context of, of tax disputes, uh, international <coughs> relations are driven more by the interests of governments, making a distinction between government and state, than by the citizens and the actors. Um, that we have got more quickly to more rational um, approaches to international dispute resolution, where a the, the state has not, sorry, the government has not felt as much of an interest in the outcome as the participants, the economic actors, the, the participators in trade, as they do in tax and whether actually the whole approach here is being skewed by, as it were, the, the self-interest of the governments and the participants in government as opposed to the interests of the state and the wider population. And that was a point which I thought probably deserves another paper, but uh, it sort of struck me from the, uh, the, the discussions of, of tax sovereignty and how they had played out here. And I'm uh, I'm wrapping up, Edward. Don't worry. Um, uh, I I I think the 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 other thing that comes back to my uh, wanting to reject the use of the word sovereignty and find a better one <coughs> is um, the extent to which we all and, and you in the paper uh, ap approach um, sovereignty uh, in a sort of quantified sense that you can lose sovereignty, you have sovereignty, and you lost sovereignty, I think what your paper brings out is the fact that the concept of sovereignty, um, A, is slightly meaningless because we live in a connected world unless you're in North Korea, um, but the, the, what is relevant is the appropriate set of attributes and powers, de jure and de facto, uh, at a particular historical point in time and given where we are at the moment, it's not really the pejorative coloured words of should we give up some sovereignty, but what is the appropriate, what are the appropriate arrangements for sovereignty, uh, sorry, control, whatever you like to use, over particular aspects of economic and, <laughs> and, and legislative life, which we need in order to uh, maintain the identity of the state and the efficient operation of the state. And, and I think... Uh, that's the point I'd sort of uh, ask you to move your work, encourage you to w move your work a little bit further, is there is there something here about the old <coughs> form of sovereignty and a newer form of sovereignty rather than a quantity of sovereignty which progressively over the decades and centuries we have lost? Because while you can look at it in that sense, I, I don't think it's helpful and coming back, and I don't want to come back to Brexit, in a sense, it has completely underpinned this, this sense that somehow we lost sovereignty when we joined the European Union, and we are regaining it, which 
uh, not only has led to some very bad outcomes, is also um, not actually uh, right at all. Um, so I think I've run out of time. But look, really, really good paper. I probably carve it up into at least two, if not three, papers, uh, uh, and, and probably uh, get a couple of uh, DPhil students to uh, um, do some work on it as well. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I found this paper to be informative, comprehensive, knowledgeable, and historically interesting. Uh, could I say that the paper is uh, on tax sovereignty and poses arbitration as a repudiable challenge to that sovereignty? Yeah. Okay. Then I must say, in as much as I do admire your paper, I must uh, disagree with points in it and I will try to um, uh, indicate. Let me be selective and pick up on tax havens um, at the right in the beginning. Over the years multiple conventions uh, did not uh, include tax havens but addressed marginal disincentives from double taxation on cross-border investment. This was despite any lack of justification for tax havens with their global ramifications through the sovereignty of states argument. Uh, the authors themselves quote Ron and Palan, any serious attempt to combat tax havens would have to be conducted at a multilateral level. I would have explored if the so-called concept of the modern doctrine of state sovereignty created <coughs> tax havens and to that extent minimize the usefulness of double taxation avoidance agreements. An important sentence in this paper appears right in the middle of it on page 16 <coughs> with respect to the 1970s DTAAs. When si signing bilateral treaties, states accepted restrictions on their taxing rights over inbound and outbound capital and agreed to cooperate on enforcement but the regime could not impose obligations on states to prevent them from engaging in the kinds of harmful tax competition that gave rise to tax havens. Further, whether after the advent of DTAAs we should not ponder the newest attempts at BEPS to be one more way of addressing the symptom rather than the disease. Certainly getting rid of tax havens is a, in a multilateral context would need sovereignty pooling rather than protecting the sovereignty of states. As far back as 1935, a report coming off the framework of League of Nations, as pointed out by the authors, um, essential rules to use a method of separate entity accounting was uh, set aside to protect sovereignty, clearly letting the state win over the taxpayer. Hearson comments that Separate accounting propelled MNCs to use DTAs to settle on jurisdictions with the lowest tax rates. Yet states could not dismantle hundreds of DTAs for practical reasons, even though they were saying, seeing what was happening through the DTAs, and instead, finally, published a model treaty in 1977. Paradoxically, double taxation of MNCs continued despite DTAs as international capital mobility increased with capital account liberalization. <coughs> In other words, simply because of the volume of um, mobility, the use uh, of DTAs um, increased. Given the complex and difficult, and I quote um, from OECD, challenge in establishing the arm's length price due to the lack of any common approach, OECD 1979, the map emerged as a recourse covering all transfer pricing disputes. Uh, in 82, the OECD wrote this. It is a non-binding instrument and an administrative decision. So even tax administrations actually like it, but maps are quite slow. Uh, they were uh, originally, now they have picked up a bit, but again, it is not a panacea. Uh, but OECD admitted uh, that in 1979, some authorities have not acted in good faith, sometimes cases lasting as long as 8 to 10 years, to quote, 
as things are, taxpayers might be exposed to heavy burdens of tax and vulnerable to arbitrary and capricious pricing adjustments <coughs> by examining revenue agents. <coughs> the scenario changed in 1986 when the U.S. began a militant approach to transfer pricing emanating from the U.S. Congress, though the U.S. executive branch conceded some sovereignty constraining arbitration clauses in DTAs, though the actual um, practice of arbitration happened only with uh, Canada. Hence the advent of arbitration. However, experience of 1990s and 2000s reveals that EU convention preserved sovereignty since domestic tax law remained supreme. Therefore, arbitration could never be a useful tiebreaker. And states even imposed penalties on companies which would be waived if arbitration was not triggered by them, by the taxpayers. Reflecting increased complexity in uh, a growing complexity in international taxation, negative assessments were bound to emerge, which they did in 1984, regarding the prevalence of double taxation. Finally, in 1995, the OECD issued new transfer pricing guidelines. Um, moving towards an arbitration requirement, as Martin pointed out, as a safeguard against double taxation. In 2017s, let us jump to it, there's lots of uh, things in between, the EU drifted further to more sovereignty constraining arbitration design. An EU convention led to an EU directive. And a change in the US attitude to arbitration led also or influenced a shift in the OECD towards arbitration. All this implied an incremental erosion of judicial sovereignty according to the authors and they sound slightly critical about it. Hearson comments that sovereignty preservation therefore was no longer a norm, states giving up their right to say no. The result is a net transfer of revenue from governments in double taxation cases where governments cannot agree amongst themselves to the multinational taxpayers. And recent changes in arbitration procedures and provisions are more binding on the states. Are the authors critical of this? As I always explain, the tail cannot wag the dog. Global growth and productivity are certainly more important than powers lying with tax authorities <coughs> globally and as OECD itself has pointed out repeatedly has been more often misused than not and than appears to the naked eye. Here's some comments. Attributes to of sovereignty from domestic revenue authorities and courts to private individuals acting as arbitrators. In many recent arbitration cases, taxpayers have more rights of veto power over the process than do states. His explanation, if states had opted for consolidation of accounts across related entities away from the separate entity principle, it would have been better. Here I agree. Uh, consolidation is also a hallmark of transparency. In the final analysis, taxpayer rights should reign supreme and consolidation would help. My final concluding remark is, what is the author's position? Would they like to maintain sovereignty, move away from uh, um, uh, uh, forceful uh, arbitration, where would all this <coughs> lead? The multinationals would be left without too much taxpayer rights and I think global um, productivi productivity would certainly uh, 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 be uh, set aside. And here I must say that when we are in the tax world of which I am a part, we forget that the tax must follow growth. I would say that a movement away from the heuristic concept of state sovereignty would be beneficial and would continue to be beneficial not only for global growth but also between private and public equality. Hence the need for further progress in multilateralism without of course being led by the unilateral interest of a single powerful member. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. You have two minutes to answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for those amazing comments. Uh, all really helpful. Let me let me pick up on a few of the themes. So, firstly, uh, Parthas just picked up at the end there. Like the the counterfactual here is um, 
is that states would adopt unitary taxation, I guess. This is the, you would not need to go down the development of this complex dispute settlements procedure if you adopt unitary taxation and the proponents of unitary taxation are correct. Um, so, right, so, so the, the tendency in the literature, in the political literature that we're trying to get away from is the tendency that says um, the hallmark of radical change that would resolve the problems of the international tax regime is to adopt unitary taxation because I don't think it's valid to have, a, have that as a counterfactual when it's untested. I think that uh, it would, uh, problems would emerge with that, which, uh, which would create different kinds of complexity and different, different issues. With it. So I, uh, we're trying to slightly move away from a tendency in our literature which tends to, to make that up as the yardstick, and also a tendency which tends to focus entirely on the, ta the, the double non-taxation problem, the tax saving problem, as the only problem that the regime faces to point out that actually does it even serve the function for which it's designed, which is to resolve, to, to prevent double taxation, and in fact often not. So, so we're, we're trying to make some interventions in the literature with which, uh, which is I think a bit unsatisfactory in ways which probably don't necessarily come across if you're not uh, absorbed in the literature. Um, um, and so <coughs> hopefully that gives a bit of context. Um, but I, th I think it's clear we need to foreground these things a bit, and we should just, uh, since you were, what you were just saying about tax, let's talk about that later. I'm interested in, the, the, the challenge about low-income countries is really, really <coughs> important, from, from <coughs> Michael and Daisy, and, and, and yes, um, and yes, it would not be incrementalism for low-income countries, is the point, it would be big bang in adoption of it. Um, and I, I could write a, probably should write a whole separate paper about this. M m my feeling is, as I said to Sir and Johnny, that, um, this is a story which, as is often the case, lower income countries are kind of incidental in the story, and that's the problem. Um, uh, that the, the regime design builds in terms of the problems facing the large powers, and then the lower income countries, as an incidental benefit to those large powers, when it's applied to lower income countries, it tends to benefit them in terms of both revenue base and their multinational uh, interests. Um, and so I think. Um, I think I, I want the yeah. I think I need to take the challenge of talking about local countries, but I I also think that the story there is different because I think the story is an emerging one much more recently of low income countries now being pressured into adopt arbitration, um, and uh, and that's where I would get on normative and say that I don't think it's a good thing. Um, but uh, and the person who's written the most, I think, the most sophisticated about this is Michael, actually. So, um, and your point about baseball and recent opinion, Michael's covered in the last one very well. Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, let me see, what was I going to say about this? Um, so I, I think there's a, there's a, there's a thing, which, thing which has come across, actually, in, in, in all of your comments, which is, um, like, what's, what's the state... What is the state's objective in designing, in entering into international tax agreements, in designing an international tax regime? Is it to promote investment, or is it to raise tax revenue? Well, of course it's both. And different bits of the state have different objectives in that regard. And I think, actually, that's the piece of the puzzle that political scientists have been, have failed so far to, to, to resolve, is how they, and it's our job to resolve, is to understand how states reconcile these often conflicting objectives. Um, and I think, uh, I think we need to do more work on that. And so I think probably if there's a lacuna in my analysis there, um, I need to think about how to fill that, but also recognise that actually that's a theoretical problem with political science literature. And this. We're not very good at dealing with the fact, because all the literature focuses on the international level, we're not very good at then looking at an individual state and saying, well, how does it reconcile these different objectives? <coughs> um, yeah, but, but the one part of the story that I think is clear is that you can see it, you can see when you talk to the people who negotiate treaties that they see investment promotion <coughs> they see arbitration as, as, as essential for investment promotion in precisely the way the path I was describing and they see the administrators who create the double taxation problem in the way that they apply the arbitration principle and the PE definition and other parts of the treaty as a problem and certainly I think the story in Canada I've heard from multiple sources the reason why Canada has agreed to this with the US even though they always lose although we don't know that formally, but we know that, um, is because the, tr the tax administration, that's, that's the outcome the tax administrations want. They want to rein in, that, sorry, that's the negotiators want, they want to rein in their assessing officers. So I think that 
the state isn't a unitary epigram. The state has different objectives depending on which bit of the state you're talking about. Um, l uh, let me stop there. Thank, Thank you. you very much, and we have six minutes break. <laughs> <laughs>